Good afternoon, and thank you for the honor uh, of participating in this year's uh, Oslo Freedom Forum. My first conscious political memory was the Russian Democratic Revolution of August 1991, the three days and three nights that finally ended the Soviet regime. I was 10 at the time, too young to participate, but old enough to grasp the lesson of what was happening. And that lesson for me was that, however strong the dictatorship, when the people are prepared to stand up for their freedom, all that strength becomes powerless. The leaders of that attempted coup had everything at their disposal. They had control of the government and party apparatus, the army, the police, the KGB's overwhelming machine of repression. They had television, newspapers, and radio stations. And they had tanks, which they sent into central Moscow. Russian citizens, Muscovites, who refused to accept that coup, were not armed with anything except their dignity and their determination to defend their freedom. And they came out into the streets in the tens and the hundreds of thousands. And they stood in front of the tanks. And then the tanks stopped and turned away. That is a powerful lesson to learn at a young age. Today, as Vladimir Putin's regime continues its 16-year reign of repression against civil society and the democratic forces in Russia, the deck is once again fully stacked in its favor. The prosecutors, the courts, and the police use bogus charges to put opposition activists in jail. In fact, according to Memorial, Russia's most respected human rights organization, there are currently 86 political prisoners in the Russian Federation, a number that is already comparable with the late Soviet period. State television rails against Kremlin opponents who are denounced as traitors, foreign agents, and enemies of Russia. And although the regime is not yet using tanks, it has set up a new armed structure, the National Guard, that will be allowed to use force and shoot without warning in the event of mass protests after the upcoming parliamentary election. Elections themselves have been turned into a mere ritual, with most opposition candidates simply disqualified from the ballot in advance, and with voting marred by intimidation and fraud. For more than a decade now, the Russian parliament has been devoid of any real opposition. Not a place for discussion, in the unforgettable words of its own speaker. This artificially created image of unanimity has been used by the Kremlin to claim universal or near universal public support in Russia for Mr. Putin and his policies. And too often, this has been repeated by Western commentators. But it is not true. A government that is based on genuine support does not need to jail its opponents, censor its television, or falsify its elections. In fact, the true worth of that fake unanimity was exposed when Vladimir Putin launched his war against Ukraine and when tens of thousands of people marched through the streets of Moscow in protests. Despite the threats, despite the pressure, despite the intimidation, the line of Muscovites who came out to say no to Mr. Putin's war stretched along the Boulevard Ring all the way from Pushkin Square to Andrei Sakharov Avenue. That march was led by Boris Nemtsov, the leader of Russia's pro-democracy opposition who dedicated his life to the struggle for a freer, more democratic, and a more hopeful Russia. A former deputy prime minister, at one time heir apparent to the Russian presidency, Boris Nemtsov could have easily settled for a quiet and comfortable existence under the present regime, or at least for safety in exile. But he loved Russia too much to stand idly by and watch its future being destroyed by authoritarians and kleptocrats. And so he chose to stay and fight. And in the end, he gave his life to that fight. In February of last year, Boris Nemtsov was killed by five bullets in his back as he was walking home over the Bolshoi Moskvaretsky Bridge, 200 meters from the Kremlin Wall. When all else fails, when the threats and the smears don't work, they use bullets as the final argument. But we will not be afraid. We know that there are many people in Russia today who reject the corruption, the autocracy, the international isolation, 
that have become the hallmarks of the Putin regime. I meet these people every week as I travel around our country, as we hold street rallies, public meetings, and political discussions to try to break through that wall of propaganda and coercion, as we engage and support young opposition activists who are willing to fight against the odds by standing as candidates even in today's truncated elections, including the upcoming September election for the State Duma, in order to have their voices heard, in order to get their message across, in order to get that political experience that they will need in the future. Boycotts are meaningless. We must use every opportunity to challenge this regime, including through the flawed and manipulated electoral process. And in fact, we know from recent years that whenever real opposition candidates actually make it onto the ballot, they show impressive results, well into the double digits. And that is very uncomfortable for the Kremlin because it destroys that fake unanimity. And so today, we have more than two dozen such young leaders who are running as candidates across the country, from the shores of the Baltic Sea in St. Petersburg to the shores of Lake Baikal in eastern Siberia. They have already begun their campaigns, organizing activists, holding meetings, initiating petitions, publishing newspapers and leaflets. They have already come under pressure, some losing their jobs, others being targeted by police raids and criminal prosecution, but they will not back down. We will not back down. We will continue our work, whatever the obstacles they put in our way. And I can speak to this from personal experience. One year ago, in Moscow, I fell into a coma as a result of severe poisoning that was certainly intended to kill. In fact, doctors told my wife they estimated the chance of survival at about 5%. But I'm here. I'm back on my feet, well, almost, and back at work with my colleagues in Russia because there's nothing better this regime would like us to do than to give up and run away, and we're not going to give them that pleasure. As Boris Nemtsov always said, it is our country. We have to fight for it. Of our friends in the West, we ask only one thing. Stay true to your values. We're not asking for your support. It is our task to change Russia, and we will do it ourselves. The only thing we ask from you is that you stop supporting Mr. Putin by treating him as a respectable and worthy partner on the world stage. And above all, by allowing his cronies to use your countries as havens for their looted wealth. And please stop falling for the lie that Russians are somehow uniquely unsuited, incapable, not ready for democracy. We are suited, we are capable, we are ready, and we will get there, just like you. This may sound overly confident, but I know that we are right and they are wrong. I know that history and the truth are on our side. I know that one day Russia will be free because in the end, however strong the pressure, when enough people are willing to stand up, they succeed. And then the tanks stop and turn away. Thank you very much.